What is up, punks? We are bringing you a special edition of Block Digest with Mr. Ruben Sampson from uh, Unhashed Podcast, I hope I remember correct, and the Saul right. Bitcoin meetup. So uh, what is up today, Ruben? Are you ready to talk sidechains? Hey, man. Glad to be here. I'm always ready. So I think chiefly, uh, we kind of wanted to start with the... Uh, the new soft chain proposal uh, that you just dropped. Uh, also, by the way, stop inventing so many new things. <laughs> <laughs> At least I, uh, I'm staying with the uh, naming convention of starting with an S. That seems to be working out well. Um, so we had state chains, then we had space chains, and now we have soft chains. So there you go. A lot of S's. Yep. And a lot they of chains. definitely are. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think good place to start would be if you want to kind of just uh, boil down the high level idea for soft chains. Yeah. So uh, yeah, let's go through it. Um, so I think uh, soft chains are basically what I'm trying to do with soft chains is to get closer to an actual decentralized two way peg. And this is about as close as I've gotten, I feel, uh, but there are still some trade offs there. Um, so the goal here really is, uh, I, I kind of assume everybody knows what sidechains are, but just in case, um, the goal is to have the ability to create new chains with new consensus rules and have your Bitcoins move over to that chain and then move back to Bitcoin again without any third party in, in the middle. Uh, that's basically the goal. Um, so at a high level, soft chains achieve this by sort of cheating uh, because what we do is basically say, well, let's just have everybody who runs a Bitcoin full node also validate all the side chains, all the soft chains in this case. But we let them validate these soft chains with a special rule set that allows them to do that very cheaply, uh, but very slowly. And this is uh, basically kind of the core of the proposal is this kind of cheap but slow consensus mechanism uh, that... Uh, makes use of something called proof of work fraud proofs that I uh, also came up with about a year and a half ago. Um, so just uh, you know, at a high level, given that we have a, a method to validate any chain, including even the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, with roughly 100 megabytes every year, um, but very slow, meaning that if you're normally waiting for one confirmation, maybe now you want to wait for like a thousand confirmations or something, uh, but eventually you'll get consensus. Um, then you can you can kind of use that to create these different chains. So you have the Bitcoin main chain, and then you have, let's say, 10 or even 100 uh, other soft chains. And whenever a peg out, uh, whenever coins moving from the Bitcoin blockchain to the uh, to the soft chains, are, it's very easy. That's just kind of freezing your coins, uh, and you just see, okay, the coins cannot move on the Bitcoin blockchain anymore. But moving back, that's always the question. How do you know? that on uh, a specific chain, something happened that allows you, that that basically get, makes you eligible to unlock these, unfreeze these, these coins on the Bitcoin blockchain. And that's where we use this very slow but cheap consensus methods to basically have a very slow peg out where it takes actually about a year or well, you, can, you can choose anything you like, but like a year seems like a good number. And given that, the the we actually do get consensus just slowly uh everybody will be on the same line after a year and be like okay yeah this peg out is is valid or no this peg out is not valid obviously i'm leaving some uh some big uh open questions here uh, but that's essentially the high level uh idea so how am i doing so far i think just the, the fraud proofs uh maybe break that down a little more i'm not sure uh yeah Listeners might get the uh, the whole point of the header verification there. Yeah, so that's uh, that's really the meat of it. Uh, so so just one more uh, thing to add before we move over to the uh, the fraud proofs. Um, so these these chains they are really slowly validated, but you can opt in to fast validation. Like anyone can take any of these soft chains and just fully validate them, download every block, validate every block, and then they get fast consensus. So if you actually want to use the chain you do have to run a, a full node for that chain. But as long as you're not doing so, you can get away with a cheap but slow consensus. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, let's uh, let's jump into uh, the uh, basically the method of getting slow but cheap validation. Uh, so this is something that works for Bitcoin as well. And initially, when I present uh, when I uh, uh, posted about it, I, I just I didn't even have uh, sidechains in mind. I was just thinking like, oh, this seems to be a way where we can get um, kind of like SPV consensus, but much more secure than regular SPV. Um, so before we head into the whole sidechain story, let's just focus on that. And, and let's say, OK, well, if we wanted to validate the Bitcoin blockchain uh, with less effort than we do today, and we do want some good security guarantees of, of whether or not uh, what we're coming up with is, is true or not, how would we do that? So the uh, naive way of doing it would be um, the original SPV proofs. And that's uh, basically you make the assumption that the, the chain with the most proof of work is uh, probably valid because otherwise uh, all these miners wouldn't have put in all that effort. Uh, well, that turns out it's a bad assumption because if everybody assumes that the, the chain with the most proof of work is just valid and nobody actually checks any consensus rules, uh, then you basically give miners a, a, a free check where they can print coins for themselves and nobody will know because nobody's checking. Um, so that doesn't work. And it's, uh, it's generally, this is this is kind of uh, also the basis of what the original sidechains proposal was was kind of trying to utilize, but they ended up having to abandon it because, yeah, it's just, it's just not secure. Uh, you can't just assume that whatever has a lot of proof of work is valid uh, without checking it. Um, so what we got here is uh, the, the, the thing, the trick that I'm using, which I'm calling proof of work fraud proofs, is that we're looking at the Bitcoin blockchain and we're looking at all the blocks and we're looking at all the forks. So this is, we just we just check the headers. So we only download you know, the, the first 80 bytes of every block and you just see the proof of work. And then every now and then you'll see a fork, right? So you'll see block one coming in, block two coming in, block three, block four, block five. And then suddenly there's a, a block 2B where uh, basically, a, a miner decided to build up uh, on top of block one and ignore the current block five. And well, the question that becomes, well, why did the miner do that? Why did the miner ignore the current most proof of work chain with block five and start building on top of uh, block one and ignore the original two, three, four, five? Well, one of the reasons for that could be, well, may maybe the miner's just stupid, right? That, that could be one reason. Um, but the the main uh, thing here is that it is potential evidence that that miner thinks that block two is actually invalid, and he wants to build on top of the valid most proof of work chain. And since the current most proof of work chain is not a valid most proof of work chain, he ignores it. So you can use that as a hint, and you can say like, well, whenever a miner forks, there must be something fishy here, uh, or there might be at least. Like, the miner could also just do something wrong, of course, or it could just be coincidence if if two blocks are found at the same time. But if we go and we investigate, we can actually figure it out. So from that assumption, we not only validate block two, but we also assume that block one is valid because this miner didn't fork off of some earlier block, but he, he chose to build on top of block one, meaning that even this other miner also thinks block one is valid. Um, so with, with that jumping off point, we now need some way to validate the transition from block one to block two. And generally speaking, you can't really do that like if it's in the middle of the chain. Like if you think of this as block 1001 mm -hmm. uh, to 1002, uh, you normally you would need the entire um, the entire UTXO set to be able to validate a transition from one point to another uh, somewhere in the middle of a chain. So what we can do here is actually uh, some uh, the work by Taz Dreja on U3XO and uh, well similar proposals as well. Um, if you're not fully familiar with that, um, there is a good uh, 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 Van Weerdum Shorts NATO episode. Uh, there's a podcast uh, where I was a guest where we go into U3XO in detail. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, for for this specific proposal. What you got to know is that. You essentially you can put a you can put the UTXO you can put a commitment to the entire UTXO set in every block, and then you can refer to that and prove that certain transactions were inside of the UTXO set. So if we know that block one is valid, or if we're assuming block one is valid, 
and we get the we see the UTXO set commitment inside of block one, which we then also assume is valid. And then we get the proofs that are attached to that UTXO set commitment uh, that basically show that the um, the transactions that are being spent in block two were actually part of the UTXO set in block one. And that's roughly utilizing UTXO, that's roughly one megabyte worth of data. Um, then we can validate the transition and we can know we can we can validate without knowing the entire UTXO sets whether or not a block two in a vacuum the transition from block one to two is valid, and that's how we um, we we get around that issue. And so, long story short, what you got now is a way to ignore uh, all the blocks for which no forks occur, because apparently no miner whatsoever thinks any of these blocks have any issues. But the blocks for which forks do occur, which uh, you know, I should remind you, is expensive, right? You, you don't, you can't just create a block, and that's the whole point here, because otherwise uh, it would be very spammable, right? If you could just make the claim and say, "Oh, this block is invalid," go, go, valid, go check it. Uh, if it was just a cheap claim, uh, you would run into issues. But because it's proof of work, you don't have that. Uh, you can't be spammed. And roughly speaking, um, there are I forgot the numbers, but there are like um, maybe ten four blocks every three months or so. So you end up with roughly 40, 40 blocks uh, with Bitcoin's current consensus that you need to download and validate. And then you get the UTXO set proofs as well. And that comes down to roughly 100 megabytes. So with 100 megabytes, you can actually completely fully validate the Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah. And so pretty much the idea here with soft chains is that when you if you mandate these types of utxo commitments and then use these proof of work fraud proofs for the side chain then you can mandate main chain nodes verifying at least that with with some kind of, of sanity cap like you're you're only marginally um in theory raising the uh, main chain nodes cost yeah so so there's a there's a cost increase and the tricky thing is the cost increase depends on how many forks there are in the chain. Uh, so, so that's kind of a, uh, you know, a thing where you need to make sure that these other chains, these other soft chains, they have sufficiently expensive per work because if they don't, uh, then you get back into that problem where you can create lots of forks for very cheaply. And now you basically have a DOS attack on all the uh, Bitcoin full nodes that also have to validate all the forks of these uh, soft chains. Um, so that's kind of uh, one thing. Um, but yeah, it uh, it ends up um, uh, you know specific to so just so, so just the uh, you know forgetting about soft chains for a second, right? So we have with this we have a way to to validate the Bitcoin blockchain slowly, uh, and the reason it's slow, I mean that's something I still got to point out, right? Um, is that mm -hmm. you don't want to assume that there are many honest miners. In fact, you kind of want to assume that there's almost nobody who's honest. So let's take a conservative number like zero point one percent. So well, if 0.1% of all miners are, are actually creating honest blocks and, and you're assuming that the other 99.9% .9 is just out there to get you and doesn't want to behave honestly, um, then consensus is very slow because you've got to wait for the fork to occur. And that when you normally want to wait for maybe six confirmations, now you've got to wait for 6,000 confirmations. Uh, but the point is you get there eventually. And if you, you know, if you go back to the actual like peg in, peg out mechanism, if that takes a year, then 6,000 confirmations is, is absolutely fine. You can, well, 6,000 is maybe, yeah, yeah, you, you still be able to get there. So, yeah, that um, that basically uh, for, for the peg in, peg out mechanism, if we make that sufficiently slow, the slowness of this consensus mechanism uh, ceases to matter, essentially. Yeah. And so... That that kind of creates the the dynamic where how much hash rate is actually um, you know mining these soft chains kind of directly correlates to how long of that that period you have to to wait to peg out to be safe, and if that like that kind of in the proposal you said sets out kind of a, a floor difficulty that you want to be able to meet, um, otherwise like this becomes potentially very unsafe. Yeah, so that's you, you could set a floor, uh, and what that would do is um, 
So, so specific to the one year waiting period, that's going to be measured in Bitcoin blocks, right? So you're not going to measure that in soft chain blocks because that would in itself kind of be, you know, you want to assume Bitcoin as the, uh, as kind of the benchmark. Um, but yeah, what you can do is you can say that if a soft chain becomes not very popular, then you just, requ you require it to still create a certain amount of proof of work in order to create a block. And if they can't do that, well, then tough luck. Uh, they don't get to create a block. And what that does is basically the consensus will slow down and blocks will come in slower because they need to get enough fees and it takes a long time to get her those fees because people are not making enough transactions apparently. Um, so that would be one way of doing it. And uh, that that would basically be to you know protect Bitcoin for the worst case scenario. I mean, you're, you're going to have to be conservative in general, not... Uh, you don't want to create a soft chain that is not very popular uh, to begin with. Uh, you want to kind of expect there to be um, a lot of demand for it. So so it does get sufficient proof of work. But just in case if the chain dies or something like that, that you, you have that. Uh, <clears throat> basically, the worst case scenario is, is being uh, tampered uh, in, in that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it's still kind of, um, how do I put this? Um, like, it's still you, you get what i mean there's that correlation of like you you have to look at proportionally how long of a um timeout in bitcoin blocks that you're targeting and then meet that threshold there there's kind of like the the corollary there and yeah. like this also um and this is what i think is kind of <clears throat> a downside of this that does have the corollary of well, any time there's any disagreement, um, which is potentially going to be, you know, towards the lower hash rate um, or proof of work on the side chain situation, the more forks that can happen or the cheaper it is to create those. <clears throat> and then yeah. this actually does increase that, that validation cost for the main chain. Yeah. So definitely you, you, need, uh, you need to ensure some kind of minimum there. Uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen, if you if you get really cheap proof of work on the on the soft chain, uh, then that opens up a DOS vector where everybody, every time there's a fork and the fork is cheap to make, uh, then everybody has to download uh, roughly two to three megabytes to to validate something. So that could become potentially very expensive. Uh, so you really need uh, sufficient proof of work to protect against that. And one potential way of doing that is to actually. Um, and this has up and down sides, but, but for this specific issue, it's a, it's a good idea. You could do merged mining. Uh, so what that would mean is, is that everybody, every, um, every soft chain would be mined by the Bitcoin miners. Uh, and the obvious downside of that is that it means that all the Bitcoin miners actually have to run all the chains, all the soft chains in, in, in full node consensus. Uh, when you're mining on one of these chains, you can't get away with, uh, with the slow consensus. That's, that's only for, uh, for uh, validating nodes uh, that are not actively uh, using the chain or mining on top of the chain. So mm -hmm. if, if you were to do that, and, uh, and you know, we can emphasize the, the downside in a minute, but if you were to do that and you were to assume that all the Bitcoin miners, A, they want the soft chains to exist because it's good for the ecosystem, and B, they get the fees, and they're already doing the work anyway for, for Bitcoin, they're creating the Bitcoin blocks, and then while they're creating the Bitcoin blocks, they're basically using the same proof of work to also stamp these, uh, these uh, soft chain blocks. And then you get a um, you get really expensive proof of work that's not easy to fork. Uh, so in that sense, it could be very beneficial. Mm -hmm. and I, like I would even go so far um, to say the only real intelligent way to implement this, at least in my opinion, would be to actually not only mandate merge mining, but um, mandate the difficulty from the main chain effectively always maps one to one to the soft chains. And so yeah. pretty much like to have the maximal um, security protection so that main chain users aren't really open to that increased validation cost as an attack vector would be to mandate all of the miners one to one um, have to mine or at least deal with the main chain difficulty and like you know, you, you know, I, I am not a fan of anything that kind of tangles other chains incentive with uh, main chain miners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just, you know, very generally speaking, I think um, 
soft chains as they are today, it's not it's not quite good enough yet. It shows a lot of promise, but these uh, yeah, there, there are some issues, and, and this would be one of them, where it seems on one side very appealing to do something like merge mining, but on the other, uh, it means we're fundamentally changing how Bitcoin works today, where well, for miners at least where miners can now kind of do cheap, uh, cons they can get uh, cheap validation because they it's just like running a full node for any, uh, anyone. Uh, but but with this method, it would mean that if we created a hundred a hundred um, of these soft chains or something, it would be a hundred x uh, cost increase on miners uh, f compared to what they're doing today. Um, so yeah, that's that is quite significant. I mean, I do, I do think uh, a big benefit though over this versus something like drive chains per se is that this would require an explicit fork for every soft chain. So it's not like yeah. you just turn soft chains on and now all of a sudden a million of them can pop up out of nowhere. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you definitely um, have. Uh, you need to get the community to actually want these chains to exist and uh, basically enable them in the system. And that, that's why it's called soft chains, because every every chain is essentially a soft fork. Um, but there is also a, kind of like a second point to that. Um, these are not loosely coupled chains, uh, like, like is the case with drive chains or with federated side chains, where the consensus of the chain is completely irrelevant to the main chain. But here, it, it, is, it is coupled just very slowly and very loo it's loose but it's not it's not quite disconnected um and what that means is that if you have if you let's say you, you took ethereum or something right and you create you, you turn it into a soft chain um it's theoretically possible you could do that but now you have all the crazy consensus rules of the ethereum uh, network and if there was a consensus rule that is conflicting with itself uh, meaning that just you know, Apple computers uh, have a different uh, view of the network than than uh, Linux computers or something, um, and they could they could disagree on consensus. So they could it could be internally um, basically the consensus could could break, um, and now that's you know after a year that does affect the uh, Bitcoin blockchain where. Half the network thinks like, no, this uh, this uh, peg out is not valid. And the other half thinks, uh, yeah, it is valid, just because uh, of the uh, consensus rules not being uh, consistent. So, whatever you um, choose as a, as a soft chain needs to have the same uh, rigorous uh, checks as we as we expect from the the Bitcoin uh, blockchain from Bitcoin Core. It needs to uh, have a very similar level to that. You could you could make changes. You don't have to have a one to one uh, copy carbon copy of Bitcoin, uh, but I would make especially in the beginning. But yeah, maybe just in general, like make conservative changes. Uh, like maybe maybe you would add something like confidential transactions. I think that would be um, you know it, it is significant, but it's also quite doable. Like anything you could see potentially being soft work into Bitcoin, but maybe being too um you know for, from a security perspective it would be doable but maybe there's not really consensus for it um that would be a viable as a soft chain but something crazy like ethereum personally i, I would not want to activate something like that mm -hmm. i mean to be fair though i do think the risk for those types of <clears throat> consensus effects spilling into the main chain like I, I would say that exists for something like drive chains as well. I mean, like part of the whole security model there is the assumption that a user activated soft fork would happen if a fraudulent withdrawal was attempted to be made. And like, you know what I mean? I, I think really at scale, that would be more likely to just split the chain than the UASF wins and, and the you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think the UASF route is, is kind of questionable. Uh, I, re I recently did uh, again on the on the Van Wertem uh podcast. I'm a, I'm a guest there once every month and a half or so. Uh, we did an episode on on drive chains, and one of the things that uh, I also wasn't really aware of, but um, it seems like uh, Paul Stortz actually kind of moved away or or, or never really held that opinion. I'm not sure which which it is, uh, but basically. 
Uh, and I, I, actually, like he, he half corrected me on this. I'm not sure if I can, if I <laughs> fully correct now. But from what I understand, the main argument is just the drive chain needs to, like miners need to not want to steal from the drive chain. It needs to be financially in their best interest to not steal from it. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. So if it gets to the point where UASF is even, even necessary, um, Paul Storch considers that that a failure, essentially. Well, I would definitely say that is a walk back because I can almost crystal clearly remember the discussions about the UASF and um, how that's the recurring or the the response mechanism to that. I, I think I even remember him specifically saying, like, what's the worst that happens? It fails and they succeed in stealing it. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, yeah, well, well, that's the that's the, the point, right, where Paul Storch would say. If if they succeed in stealing, then well, the chain needed to die, and and that that's fine. Only the drive chains that are sufficiently successful, where miners don't want to steal, are the ones that should continue to exist. And then you know maybe you get to the point where no drive chains exist whatsoever, and maybe that's just the, uh, the status quo. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's uh, I I think that's kind of the point of uh, you know the, the open question, at least for me, where it, is it. Is there really an equilibrium like that where miners want it to exist? Uh, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe, maybe there is. Like I, I'm not fully willing to discount that. Um, but I, I'm also skeptical of whether or not you know that's how it's going to pan out. But I'm actually kind of curious. Um, at this point, I kind of feel like it would be nice to see uh, drive chains. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, in, in practice, like I, I think it's hard to actually implement it because it requires a soft fork and no way well i think it's very likely there's there's, there's going to be consensus for that but i would like to see it as an experiment uh, maybe on some other chain or whatever i i just i just want to see how that works out i just really i don't know <clears throat> i i think i've made my peace with the fact that space chains can be launched um no matter what if we get something everybody wants for the lightning network but i'm just i'm still I, I don't like the idea of deploying something that starts tangling with minor consensus and incentives unless everybody is explicitly okay with that. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so difficult to ever like, like, like even like, let's say if I, I had to make that decision, like, you know, that's not how Bitcoin works, but if I had to decide, do we activate the drive chain soft fork? I, I, I would I would be very hesitant. I would want to study a lot more if it all if it all depended on me. Um, but yeah, I would I would be hesitant to to make a change like that, right? Um, because because of all the indirect uh, consequences it might have. Um, so I want to see the experiment, and maybe if the experiment gives us the data that shows us that it's actually safe, then maybe we can consider it for Bitcoin. But before that, yeah, it's just uh, like you said, like you're saying, like it's a big risk, um, and it's not one that uh, I think you can easily convince uh, people to take. So yeah. Well, I mean, here we're we're kind of going off in a tangent. I'll try and steer us back <laughs> in a second, but um, like I, I just remember what, one of the first things I started thinking about with drive chains that really started souring the idea was. I'm very confident that a large majority of hash rate operation in the next 10 years or so is either going to be big corporate players, big governments, or very tightly intertwined with one of those two. And I just can't help but think that, it, you know, if Bitcoin really does just explode into a massive financial asset at the core of the world, um, which it looks like that's actually going to happen soon. Um, like politics absolutely becomes a part of the threat model for something like drive chains. Like, you know, maybe, maybe Russia um, sours with China and we buddy up with China and we just go, hey, um, China, why don't we rip off Russia's uh, drive chain? <laughs> And yeah. like at that kind of, of level, like that really is something that you might just boop the chain splits and it stays split. 
because you yeah. have massive political entities like that that are like fuck you fuck you and they just split off their own separate ways yeah i mean uh it's hard to oversee but uh, yeah i mean it's a, it's a strong example right where you have these big nation states and uh they yeah if they have a lot of hash and power uh, they might be able to use that as a political uh pawn to uh, to get their way um so yeah i can i can see that um yeah I, like i said i find it very difficult to you know fully oversee what the consequences would be in a situation like that um and whether or not that would be good or bad like i, I feel like you know it's already the case for bitcoin right like bitcoin itself already the way it is today it's already so difficult to argue whether it's secure enough whether everything will continue to function under different circumstances um, and then adding more assumptions to that, uh, yeah, that's that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just that that's really like kind of the heart of what worries me about these kinds of like systems where it's like let's let's piggyback on the the infrastructure that's already there because it's like I mean th this is going to get really crazy in the next five years. Um, just as is like, and those incentives can get real, like we're, we're already seeing like mining pools that are saying like regulate what miners can mine. We won't mine anything on the OFAC list. Like, and yeah, that, that's just so much to, to, that's just so much to drop on the table that can just further cause incentives getting wonky. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I think the uh, that OFAC news was actually turned out to be uh, incorrect. So it was uh, slush pool. Oh no, no, I'm, I'm I'm speaking about a uh, DMG there. Um, the, oh, the Canadian yeah, okay. pool. Okay, yeah, yeah, that that pool. I think they haven't even started yet, but they, yeah, they they did claim they were gonna uh, yeah, censor transactions. That's right. But it's like you know, it's yeah. I I would really love to have like something like this work out in a secure way, but it's, I just get butterflies in my stomach. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, to bring it back to soft chains, drive chains, essentially they just assume that the miners are going to keep the chain uh, alive because they apparently want to, because they get enough fees from it. Uh, but here you have basically the users actually deciding whether or not the chain, uh, whether pegouts are, uh, are, are valid or not. You're not relying on the miners in, 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 in that way, uh, so it, it really, uh, you know, it's sort of there. There's a lot of similarity there with drive chains, but it really, um, yeah, it takes out that pain point of the miners being in control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's but, a good yeah. a good time to jump into it. Um, like you, you pretty much in the uh, the gist that you published just completely left undefined the actual um pegging mechanism itself yeah. like are, are there any kind of like thoughts or like um favorite ideas or options for that yeah i think uh you know there are a lot of like tiny des design decisions there um that i feel need to be decided at a later stage so even even if i can have an opinion on that now yeah you know, i've thought about it enough to the point where I see that it's just possible, so I'm not worried about it. Uh, but you know, it's it's kind of like um, it's a weird thing because you sort of have like a UTXO set management um, for every soft chain that needs to be kind of done on the on the full node side. It's entirely possible, but it's just uh, yeah, it's just a can of worms that I decided to kind of leave unopened. Um, but uh, you know, one thing that's kind of interesting uh, to say about that is that. Um, you could go all the way from keeping it very simple and making sure that there's only one UTXO per chain. And then whenever you want to peg in, you need to take that UTXO and spend it and kind of put it in a new UTXO together with your new coins. And you could do something like that. Um, and during the peg out, what you need is uh, you don't want to actually spend that specific soft chain UTXO during the peg out. Uh, you want to kind of m more have a, a sort of um, a messaging system saying like, I, I want to spend, I want to spend a certain amount of coins from that UTXO. Because if you actually spend it and you kind of occupy that spot and it was actually an invalid peg out and it turns out that it was invalid after after about a year, um, then for a whole year, actual valid peg outs are blocked as well. Uh, so, you know, you don't want that. 
Um, so only after a year, uh, and once you know that the, the peg out is valid, are you allowed to take coins out of a certain UTXO and create that transaction? Um, then there's also kind of a, you know, a more crazy model that I, I think is too crazy for Bitcoin, but it's interesting, <laughs> interesting nonetheless, which is that you could create colored coins or tokens that represent the peg out. So let's say I, um, I peg out 10 Bitcoins and now I get to wait a year. Well, what if those 10 Bitcoins already were tokens that are not Bitcoins, but they're to be to be redeemed for Bitcoin later if this pay, peg out is actually valid? Then I can already spend them on the main chain and I can, or I can already send them to other people. Uh, and o the only people who would accept those those coins are people who actually validated the chain from which the peg out is coming. And if they did full validation, they would know whether or not that peg out is valid or not. Uh, so they would know whether uh, whether these tokens are going to be redeemed for the full value in the future. Um, and if there's a market for that, you can actually see that reflected in the price. So the price would reflect um, whether or not the peg out is valid or not. Again, I think this is too much complexity for supply Bitcoin, uh, but it's interesting because it it kind of uh, it makes peg outs optionally fast for those who bother to do the validation. Okay, so so pretty much a lock the uh, the actual Bitcoin in the soft chain with a special script that like after like X blocks um, this token or its child can claim whatever the token's worth. Okay. Yeah, again, pretty high level, but yeah, that's that's about it. Well, I mean, it it definitely sounds crazy and like that eats up a lot of chain space, but um that also does kind of solve the issue of interactivity because I, I was kind of thinking along the lines of how do you have a script on the main chain reference a UTXO um, on the, the soft chain, given that everything's only downloading the headers unless there's a split. So like how, mm. you, you know what I mean? Like that, that would require yeah. a lot of interaction there just to be able to validate something. And where's that data coming from? How is it being passed around and so on? Like, yeah. So, so what you would need is um, basically in the uh, Merkle tree where the transactions are, uh, you're going to have a top level branch uh, that is the peg out transaction or transactions, depending on how you want to do it. Let's say if there's only maybe one peg out per block. Um, so there could possibly only be one transaction, which is very high up in the Merkle tree. So it doesn't, uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't even have to be, but that would be slightly cheaper if you wanted to download and validate that specific transaction. So you could actually see if what's being re referenced is uh, is there or not without uh, downloading a whole lot. Uh, so that, that would be kind of one way of doing it. Um, and then the whether or not that transaction is valid that's inside of that block, that just completely depends on the proof work fraud proof mechanism, right? Where after a year, if nobody forked that block, then we're just assuming that that transaction with the pegout information is actually uh, yeah, what is uh, supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I get you. I, I don't know. Starting to cross wires in, uh, in my brain here with different thoughts. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I, I think one thing we haven't really like sufficiently, um, pointed out is that there is, uh, so, so the one thing we pointed out is that there can be consensus risks where you might have a uh, disagreement on, on what the consensus is because of some kind of bad, uh, consensus rule in the soft chain, like Ethereum chain or something. Uh, but there's also just the uh, general risk that somebody actually goes and does a one-year uh, reorg right at the moment when a peg out was about to become valid. Um, and what that would do is that maybe half the network saw the reorg and half the network didn't see the reorg. Uh, and now half the network thinks the peg out is valid and half the network thinks that the peg out is not valid. Um, and, and that is actually uh, going to uh, literally affect uh, the Bitcoin blockchain where um, you could basically have a fork um, because some people are spending those, 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 pe those coins that were pegged out uh, and others think they should not have been spent. Yeah. But I mean, that's kind of right back in a circle to why... Uh it would be kind of crazy to do something like this without merge mining. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so again, this this is another reason why uh, 
it needs to be very expensive uh, to create forks. Um, yeah, yeah, ba yeah, basically that. I mean, it, you know, it, it is, despite all my misgivings on this, still an interesting idea. Like, especially if you took it as far as mandating merge mining and meeting the main network difficulty and things like that. Yeah. Just in the sense that in that security model, like for any consensus issue to cause a split like that would require such a large portion of Bitcoin miners acting malicious that even if it might not result in a split or anything like that, that's still a global system issue that you have to worry about. And yeah. people can opt in with the different validation models and costs. Yeah, that's right. So it, it does, uh, you know, in, in the, yeah, like you're saying, right? They're, they're like upsides and they're downsides. And it's interesting. So yeah, I, I kind of feel like this needs more eyes on it and this needs more thinking um, just to see how far we can push it to make it safe enough where we say like, okay, well, with the merch mining, uh, I guess it's okay. Um, and then maybe look at uh, the, you know, the miner thing. Like, is, is it really going to work out uh, well for the miners if they have to do 100 times as much validation? Is that not going to cause problems? Like, look into that really uh, deeply. You know, maybe maybe there are ways to to kind of make it work. Um, and I guess, you know, it would be kind of a, um, uh, a possible alternative for a block size increase, right? Where we have the option of, uh, you know, let's say, uh, I don't know, 10 years from now or something where uh, we're finally at the point where... Uh, or maybe 20 years, whatever, we're, we get to the point where, okay, now the block size is too small. Uh, computers have gotten so so good that my phone can validate everything in a day uh, and, and like easily. Uh, and there's no bandwidth uh, issues uh, because you know everything gets faster over time, but the Bitcoin block size uh, stays constant. Um, maybe at that point you're like, okay, well, we can hard fork or we can activate a couple of these soft chains. If we activate a couple of these soft, soft chains, what you can even do is you can say like, um, well, we're going to actually decrease the block size. We're going to make the block size a little bit smaller by maybe 1% to compensate for uh, the extra overhead of uh, having to run these proof work fraud proof nodes uh, and, and checking these soft chains. So then, you know, overall, you're not even increasing the validation cost of, of full nodes uh, as a whole. Um but now you're you're adding as a soft fork, not as a hard fork, uh, all these other chains. And, and similarly, uh, you know, this could also be for, like I said, like things like confidential transactions, where it's going to be very, very difficult to get consensus on something like that uh, on uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, where everybody uh, starts doing confidential transactions. But if you have it as a soft chain, uh, you know, that has uh, more potential. Mm -hmm. But you know, th this kind of bring. And this is another, I think example of why i think overall i think soft chains is a little superior to drive chains another worry about drive chains and just this kind of of thinking about things is how can this undermine mining incentives just by removing fee pressure and you know like with with drive chain you turn that on and anybody can spin up a drive chain so you're pretty yeah. much creating like this magic hose you can just jump through to like just soak all of the fee pressure out of the chain I and see. the way that spreads around like that would overall just reduce miners income because there, there's no longer the the bid up but here with soft chains again like each one has to be its own decision its own fork it's not just flip it on and watch all the miners income disappear yeah uh, yeah, that's uh, that's true. Like in that sense, it's uh, it's more conservative in uh, kind of what it enables and how much extra space is going to be there, and uh, and it requires a conscious decision um, from uh, everybody running full nodes to actually go and activate these chains. Uh, so definitely that uh, makes that that kind of worry uh, a lot less, or at least the, the the potential concern of what could possibly go wrong is is a lot is a lot, <laughs> a lot smaller, more encapsulated. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, there's one other uh, kind of mitigation method that uh, uh, might be interesting to go into for uh, the the one year reorg consensus risk. So one thing you could do is uh, you can actually disallow forks 
uh, proof of work forks of more than half a year uh, on the on the side of the soft chain. So if there's a if there's half a year worth of proof of work, and then suddenly somebody tries to reorg more, more than half a year back, uh, then that's just rejected. And what that does is it, it it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem of um, there actually being a, a, a consensus risk because that kind of uh, rule of not allowing a, a rework, it, it, that that in itself actually creates the same problem. Uh, but what it does is it pushes the problem forward by half a year and it, and it puts it onto the soft chain. So now on the soft chain side, there's, there's a disagreement on consensus where some people... You know, let's say that half a year reorg happened right at the, uh, you know, right at the threshold where uh, half a year worth of proof of work was being mined, and then half a year somebody else created a new a new half year worth of proof of work. So now there's a kind of a consensus disagreement, but the consensus disagreement now is occurring on the soft chain side, and now we have basically kind of like half a year to figure it out which of these chains is valid. Uh, but you know, the, the tricky thing is that requires. I think at the very least, like a soft fork from everybody who runs proof of work for proof of notes. So you kind of go back to the UASF thing, um, but only in these kind of very specific cases where there's like a huge uh, reorg uh, issue. And this would be um, instead of having an actual, having it directly affect Bitcoin consensus. So it seems like it's still a win, um, but it has down other downsides as well. Yeah, so it'd pretty much be like an alarm bell and like everybody has six months to figure this out socially and fork accordingly or the problem can domino to the main chain too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah, it's just basically a, you have an alarm bell, right? You, you have a heads up about something something being off uh, and you can spring into action. But you know, because that action is not automated, it's, it's still the same problem. You still have a consensus disagreement. It's just... Uh, yeah, it's just that the, uh, yeah, it's slow when you see it coming. Yeah. I mean, hmm. oh man, Bitcoin's incentives. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we roughly uh, covered all the uh, soft chain stuff, unless there's uh, is anything else specific. Uh, you think we should uh, should be covering, but I think I think kind of we kind of went through it all. Yeah, I uh, think we're at that point. So there's uh, yeah, there's some space chain stuff I could get into, or some other random things I've been working on, um, or or we can just wrap it up. I don't know uh, how you are on time. Uh, what do you oh. what do you think? Uh, I am definitely down for either space chain talk or random things you're working on. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah, so the uh, the space chain stuff has kind of been interesting. So um, when we went through it, I ha hadn't given it the name space chains yet. Um, so space as in block space. Um, but yeah, uh, for for the listeners, definitely go back to that episode. Uh, I think we call it blind merch mining. Um, but the uh, you know the high level overview, because we're not going to go into it now. We've 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 covered it. Is that you can sort of. Um, use the Bitcoin blockchain as a as a as a mining mechanism for other chains. So that you you don't have to have your your own proof of work algorithm, but instead you just pay Bitcoins to Bitcoin miners and they will put your uh, block hash into the Bitcoin blockchain. And then somehow you through doing that you will get consensus uh, on this other chain. So with that mechanism, uh, you can basically create any chain you want, um, but it's essentially an altcoin it's essentially just a completely different chain it could have been ethereum for instance where it's just uh just ethereum but they uh, instead of their own proof of work mining algorithm they kind of um uh, use bitcoin uh, as a as a way to um yeah pay fees to bitcoin miners and the bitcoin miners will will do the proof of work for them essentially so the uh, the second part of this is the uh perpetual one-way peg and the idea there is to have some way to create a token on this this other chain and if you created a chain that is not an altcoin and the way uh, i envisioned doing that was just saying like okay well we you just burn bitcoins so whenever you burn a bitcoin you get a space coin and that's how you get these coins on this chain and these these coins can never be worth more than bitcoins because 
you burnt your Bitcoins to create them and you can always m move from Bitcoin to space coin, but you cannot move back. So that's kind of where we left off last, last time, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, from that point, um, I've, uh, I've had a few conversations with, uh, well, lots of people that uh, watched my uh, uh, Space Chains video uh, that, I, that I put online. Also something that uh, listeners can, uh, can check out. If you, I think if you search for Ruben Thompson and then uh, Space Chains on YouTube, you'll, you'll probably find it. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss all the uh, required reading in the show notes for everybody so they can just look down there. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so, so there have been a couple of uh, ideas kind of floating around as to, as to what to do uh, with this uh, perpetual one-way pack. And um, one interesting idea by uh, uh, Fernando Nito, uh, he, uh, he suggested that if you had some kind of way to know the ratio, like the, the price of Bitcoin, if you had some kind of consensus mechanism that would um, check for that, then you could actually, whenever you, you burn a Bitcoin, you could get a USD equivalent number of tokens. So right now, where's Bitcoin at? 45,000 or something? I don't even know. Um, uh, let's just say 40,000. So if you were to burn one Bitcoin, you would get 40,000 um, kind of like USD space coins. Um, and then and, uh, a year from now, when Bitcoin is at 400,000, uh, let's hope, then when you burn a Bitcoin, you actually get 400,000 400, uh, USD space coins. And uh, the funny thing is that this is actually, if you were to do this, you can actually create a stable peg because the, uh, the assumption is that uh, the US dollar is such a lousy store of value that over time it goes down. So whatever value you have on the chain, let's say there's a, you have a million dollars worth of USD on the chain, well, one year from now, that's only going to be worth, um, you know, nine hundred thousand dollars in today's currency. Uh, obviously, it's still going to be a million dollars, but it's not going to be worth the same amount as it was uh, today. Um, so, because of that, you kind of have a natural, um, you have a natural place where tokens exit the system or value exits the system. Uh, because the U.S. dollar is such a, such a lousy store of value, and that actually creates peg stability. So, so the claim is that you can utilize this to get a stable USD value token on on a blockchain. Hmm. And it's not easy to wrap your head around, of course. But uh, do you sort of get what I mean? I kind of get the the basic idea, but like in my head, like for some reason, I like somebody with bitcoins would have to be willing to accept that for real bitcoins in order to really close that loop there. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, the assumption is that there's actual one there's demand for dollars, right? So so you, if you're like and that's kind of the weird thing, right? Like if you're a bitcoiner, you know, you don't you don't want dollars. So so you're not really the 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 target here. Uh, but I, I think the trade-off here, the right trade-off, the way to look at it is that uh, you get stability at a cost. So if you if you are a merchant, you might rather take uh, dollars uh, compared to uh, bitcoins because you don't want to have the volatility to deal with, uh, even though you might even agree that bitcoin goes up over time. Um, so it's really you're trading off um, value for stability, essentially. And uh, the second thing that uh, this was just an example of the U.S. dollar, uh, but uh, Fernando, Fernando is actually uh, working on, um, uh, I mean, he told me only a few things about it, but he, he's doing a write-up where he's um, basically looking at whether or not we can create a stable token that is better than US than the U.S. dollar, but still has these uh, uh, the same... Um, the same concept of having a really stable value. So it would actually be like a superior, you could actually do a token that's superior to the used dollar, um, but still has this uh, this kind of, you know, worth less over time effect. You're, you're going to have to send me that to uh, take a look at when we get done here. But my brain is yeah. still like obsessing over thinking through this arbitrage. So like, okay, I would have to be willing to accept this random token and give somebody real Bitcoin for it. But also, I think 
you would have to have somebody willing to give somebody actual U.S. dollars for that token as well. And yeah. I'm just trying to think through, it's like, how would that work? Because anybody giving you real dollars for the token is going to want more tokens than real dollars. And anybody who's willing to accept that token for Bitcoin is going to want to uh, get a lot more tokens than the Bitcoin is actually worth in dollars. Well, I mean, why do you assume that, right? Like, take something like USD Tether, right? You can buy one USDT for one dollar, right? That that peg holds. But it holds because ostensibly, um, minus the crypto capital stuff that got seized, there's an actual dollar in a bank somewhere that yeah, I can go yeah. get. So yeah. it's like, how how do you incentivize the equivalent token to real dollars arbitrage so that that side of things doesn't collapse? Yeah, it's... Um... I agree it's kind of a tough one to wrap your, your head around, right? Because you're sort of creating value out of thin air. Um, but it, really, the, the, yeah, the, the key here really is that the the system is leaking value. So whatever is in there is just going to be worth less over time. And because it's worth less over time, eventually it's going to be worth whatever people actually think it's worth, right? So if there's a million dollars in there and people don't value it, like everybody just thinks, well, it should only be five hundred thousand dollars. Then you know it will take a lot of time, probably. I don't know, like uh, I, I'm not sure how many hundred years it takes for for a dollar to go down half in value. But uh, whatever time period it is, eventually you'll get to the point where you're back to what it's actually worth. Um, and you know that's combined with the fact that creating these dollars is also prohibitive, right? You, you're not going to put a million dollars worth of, uh, you're not going to create a million dollars worth of these tokens if there's not a million dollars worth of demand. Uh, so so that's the, uh, the kind of the second thing. So on one hand, you're only creating as many tokens as there's demand for. On, on the other hand, if demand goes down, you have a, a valve, right? Because, because the dollar goes down in value. Okay. So yeah, so this ultimately just hinges on somebody has to be willing to take this thing for real Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, and, and the the question there would be, um, is there is there a use case because you could also just use regular dollars, right? So the, the question is, is there a use use case for decentralized dollars? That would be the question. If if there's demand for that, this would be the only way to do it. Because there's literally no uh no counterparty. There's no use the tether uh, involved somebody who's maintaining the peg uh, whatsoever. Um, if there's no demand for that, then you know I think it's just not going to be very used very much, and it's still going to be it's still going to be stable to the point where people use it, but it might only be ten dollars. Um, but it, if there's actual demand for these uh, decentralized dollars, which I think I think we've seen some hints of, right? Like if you look at uh, the UC tether market, there's actually a lot of uh, you know, illegal activity between countries where they're, they're sending dollars between each other uh, and, and they're not for whatever reason uh, willing to use Bitcoin for that. Um, so there seems to be demand for something like that, but maybe you see Tether good enough. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I generally think Tether's doing the job fine for right now, but I'm just still trying to wrap my head around the weirdness of this idea. <laughs> like this, <laughs> yeah. You know what this reminds me of? Um are you you're familiar with uh Paul Snow and Factum at all? Uh, oof, uh well I, I know uh, yeah, I don't I, I only know a tiny bit about Factum, but not much. Well the, the, there was this weird idea that they did on there where somebody could just effectively mint their own um like fiat tokens. And I, I forget the specifics, but it, it was it was kind of similar to here where the assumption was the arbitrage either holds and it works or it doesn't hold and the thing collapses. <laughs> but if it does work, like you, you effectively just have like a, a fiat token. That's not really like, go, go give it to this guy to get your dollar out of the bank. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that just sounds like a, a, a glorified use the tether peg by random people that you shouldn't be trusting. Oh, it absolutely is. Um, but I'm just saying, like, it's it's the same kind of general concept that just market volume churning through this um, could hold that arb up and make it actually work. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, like I think the difference here is that there there's an 
these these tokens cannot be created out of thin air, right? So they they will only be created to the the point where there's demand for it. But I I, I sort of agree with you in general. And I'm 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 really having a hard time, and like a, a lot of this this space chain stuff that I've, I've been thinking about these days has been very much like centered around that idea of like the weird thing it is that you create value from destroying value, right? Like it's such a strange thing. And uh, actually, I've been on the other side of the debate as well. Um, so there's a there's a guy called John Light uh, who uh, who put up an idea called a stake peg. Uh, for for space chain specifically, um, and what he suggested, which which I I kind of gave the same criticism as as, as kind of you're giving me now, uh, I, I think it's you know I think it's fair, um, and, and what he he was saying that um, you can create these space coins right by burning bitcoins, and then you stake your your space coins, and staking your space coins gives you um, basically. Uh, uh, the ability to hold somebody else's Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. And when they ask for it back, you have to give it back to them. And if you don't give it back to them, your your stake will be slashed. So you'll, you'll be, bu be punished. And the idea is that you'll be punished more than what you're gaining by keeping the Bitcoins for yourself. You know, I think I remember seeing that when that got published um, and just thinking why are people so obsessed with trying to make federations worse somehow? <laughs> I, I think it's, a, you know, I've always felt intu intuitively that it was wrong, but I, I had a hard time. Like I, I talked with him quite a bit and, uh, you know, he's not, uh, like, I mean, he's uh, like, you know, you might not like the idea, but like he's, he's, he's coming from a, from a very sincere perspective. And I had a hard time actually like criticizing it, but, uh, but I, I do feel like it's clarified a lot of these things for me where it it didn't quite make sense to me. And, uh, but it's, it's just, you know, with all these things, like it's so hard to put your finger on what it is, what it is that makes it wrong. And I, you know, that's maybe the same with altcoins and stuff. But what I liked about it was that, um, you know, he took out, like, because I, a lot of altcoins do the same shit, right? But what they do is, well, we create an altcoin, and altcoin has value because everybody's speculating. Like, okay, now we're going to use this speculative value to stake it to create something else. But then, you know, the first step of wh why you created value was just pure uh, musical chair speculation. So the token shouldn't have had value in the first place. So why are you staking your altcoin for some something else? Uh, like, that doesn't work in the long term if your altcoin itself doesn't have value. But then they go and they claim, like, well, because you're staking it, this this altcoin has value. The staking itself is what gives it value, right? And now you get the circular reference where you're like, what is going on? Well, uh, it's, and, it's, yeah. it's this simple in my mind. Um, the 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 token having value fixes nothing because if it achieves value, then you're going to have things like derivatives and so on. And so I can just hedge myself short and just steal Bitcoin. And like, then that goes into the second problem with this idea, which is you pretty much just took a federation and removed all the civil protection in that by making it an anonymous token instead of known identifiable players. So you could literally just rinse and repeat that until the whole thing collapses. Yeah, if you, if you can successfully uh, short the stake uh, that you have, I think that would basically uh, yeah, ruin it. I, I wonder what that would do to the shorting market, whether or not uh, people would not be willing to take the other side of that bet. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, that's that's really the only potential thing that could go wrong there. I mean, if you can short to a sizable amount, then just take the coins and run <laughs> and just come yeah, back and yeah. try and do it again. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. If that's... Uh, and it seems that at least to a lesser degree, like at a lower volume, that must always be possible. But then at a high volume, maybe it doesn't work. But yeah, still, it, it's all it's all kind of weird, right? Um, but um, yeah, the, the funny thing is that um, thinking about the whole thing, um, it, what it what it came down to for me is that uh, like like John Light's idea is like you know you're you're taking bitcoins. You burn them, and then you create another token with the fact that you burned them, and you stake that, and then that stake has value, 
uh, because because people will uh, because you will get slashed you know the stake you put up will get slashed uh, and that allows you to move somebody else's bitcoins like yeah it, it just seems like you're creating something out of nothing where it, it doesn't entirely add up but i you know I, I think it's very much like the same criticism you, you, you were giving me for the uh use the to- dollar chain uh use dollar chains where you know you, you just kind of left wondering like what is what is the value like where what is actually valuable here uh, although I'm I'm still somewhat convinced the USD uh, the USD chain thing actually does have some potential, but yeah, uh, maybe it's the same thing at the end. Well, I mean, there there would be some inherent value generation, but I would posit it has nothing to do with the token itself at all. It has to do with the potential revenue you could charge in fees for federating that peg and that comes back to user demand so if there would be yeah. user demand for it like those tokens would have some marginal value based on the income they could represent but like yeah. just burning it from bitcoin does not magically guarantee it's as valuable as bitcoin yeah and that argument uh, like I, I was thinking about that as well it's like uh, you could like you could have a, a federation well, not even a federation, just a single server, right? Where Bob Bob runs a uh, a, a side chain, and um, Bob gets fees for the fact that he runs the side chain. And as long as those fees that he's getting are more than what he gets from just stealing the coins that are in his custody, then Bob is theoretically incentivized to not steal those coins that he has custody of. And you can trust Bob to. Um, run the side chain right and that's like you know is is, is that what we we're saying with with drive chains as well and is that what we're saying with these, these stake peg uh, ideas like where it it just comes down to you can trust people that are earning money from the activity that they're helping you perform yeah i mean that's that's what all of this really boils down to abstractly to me i mean you know, like the, the way I look at things is we have two working consensus mechanisms, um, proof of work, and we really don't know how that will continue to evolve as this system grows and what type of stuff we attach to it. And then federations. And I just, th- I think it gets really silly trying to kind of walk either one of those towards the other, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, it seems uh, it seems yeah questionable whether there's uh, there's more to it than that for sure. So um, there's one other uh, thing that I was thinking of that was kind of like uh, it, it, that came yeah I, I I was thinking about it after thinking about the whole stake back thing, uh, which is that um, for space coins one of the things you can do is you can force miners to burn a certain amount of space coins for every block that they create. And what that does is it, it creates an outlet where um, space coins are disappearing from the system and that, and they have to be compensated for that uh, through, uh, uh, through space, space chain fees. Uh, but if you, if you had a system where people could move their space coins into a chain and then you know that there's deflation on on a chain because because a certain amount of space coins have to be burned on the chain with every block. Then you sort of have the same system as I was talking about earlier with Bob Chain, right? Where Bob holds your coins, but we can trust Bob because he gets more in fees than he would in, 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 when he were uh, to steal the coins. You kind of get that inside of a space chain because instead of paying Bob, you're burning. Uh, space coins and the space coins you're burning maintain guarantee that the peg gets maintained because it, it's an outlet right where where less and less coins uh, come into existence. So I would argue if if Bob chain works, uh, you know theoretically at least right Bob should be reliable if he gets more in fees. Uh, then I think this should theoretically work as well, where yeah you basically you burn the space coins to a certain degree and you have that enforced by consensus and the only tricky part is you can't really change how much you burn because that's going to be a consensus rule and it might be hard for it if you lower it uh, you can always make it higher um but that you know the the use case there would be a chain 
where people want to make small Bitcoin transactions and they don't mind so much that they're losing value over time because that's what they do, right? When uh, when you have this uh, this, this burn, uh, you basically every time you spend it, you have to you have to burn a little bit of your of your coins. Um, but that could be that could work for a low value chain where you frequently want to change hands uh, of of the coins. So you just want to make I don't know micro transactions on a thirty two megabyte space chain or something. Um, yeah, I, I'm slightly starting to wonder, and you know, still skeptical, but slightly starting to wonder whether or not that would make sense for microtransactions or something, uh, uh, something like that. I mean, it could, because you know, ideally, if you add a use case with demand, um, with that burning like that, that's going to deflate itself, and then I mean, obviously, the instant that were to start creeping above Bitcoin, you have more coins come in until that disappears yeah. and coins stop coming in so that should arb itself out evenly if there's actual demand for whatever that chain is for yeah so that could be the um uh, already dead b cash killer <laughs> kill it even more <laughs> kill it twice <laughs> honestly with, with space chains i'm more excited about like non-currency uses you know like um yeah like a DNS system like Namecoin. Like I, yeah. I, I am still amazed that nobody has kind of picked up Namecoin and thought how do how do we build this into Bitcoin or on top of it a little more intelligently than just merge mine this altcoin. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm kind of wondering whether or not like whether there's actually demand for a completely decentralized um DNS. And and one of the issues I kind of ran into is that you know we we do have like a a few of these things right where, um, you know Nike dot com is is held by Nike and it's not held by somebody else. It's not held by some dude who was first and just bought up all the uh, all the names. Like there are rules like that that kind of make current the current DNS work. And in this kind of decentralized DNS system, you wouldn't have something like that. So you you would like how would you prevent people from just hogging all the all the um, all the brand names that might become important in the future, and you know, doesn't the system kind of kill itself because because there isn't uh, some kind of government intervention at the end of the day that gives Nike Nike.com and gives uh, uh, Google Google.com or whatever? Well, Google started with with their name, so I guess it doesn't apply to them. But you know what I mean, right? Yeah, I mean that is an issue, but you know my thinking on that is you could either solve that by expanding things to like namespace bucketing or stuff like that but also i mean honestly just launch the system i own all of that stuff i'll pass it out to the original like the the company owners or brand owners or what have you um and transfer stuff and then just tough titties like that's how i launched it like there is no massive name squatting and stuff like that now enjoy your uncensored namespace you could uh you could maybe you know it's kind of like a, a hard fork you could make a hard fork of dns and the utx set would be the current uh dns owners and they would just have their url on the on the new system too <laughs> something like that I mean, or just, like literally just I'm launching the system. My key owns all of these domains and it's like, hey, who wants theirs? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I mean, that kind of relies on. OK, so let's say you're reliable in the beginning. right? OK, cool. Um, but then like sooner or later, you, you need to let go of that. Right, control because people don't don't want to use a system where you're in, you're in control forever, I, I would assume. Um, yeah, well, it I don't know. Be in control, just pre-registering a chunk of the namespace to stop shenanigans, um, and yeah, then yeah. like everything else is still open. Yeah. Okay. I see. So it's kind of like a uh, yeah, the white knight, uh, basically getting the uh, or a white hat hacker. Maybe it's a better <laughs> better analogy. <laughs> getting the uh, namespace before the before the bad people can, and then uh, yeah, 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 maybe. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, I'm I'm just a little skeptical whether or not like it ends up working at the end of the day, or whether this is just kind of like you know more of a dream where we want to decentralize everything, but does it really make sense? You know, I, I'm not fully certain, but at the same time, yeah, why not? Uh, if we can do this as a space chain, uh, we should give it a try, see how it goes. And it's definitely nice that there, there's no altcoin involved, like uh, like with Namecoin. 
Yeah, well, I mean, there's two ways I look at things like decentralizing DNS. Um, at a bare minimum, it would make Tor hidden services so much easier for people to interact oh, with. Okay, yeah. And then also just in the future, I fully expect the internet to become more and more dystopian. And um, you are wrong, think. You are deleted. So um, I, I think that you know that's a good starting point is something like tor giving that a namespace but yeah. i think there's a real big chance that that demand is going to grow a lot in the next 10 years yeah yeah i, I can see the use case for tor uh, so that makes sense yeah so yeah i mean uh, why not right like uh especially like the nice thing about space chains is that it's just completely permissionless right like anybody can create any chain um so if uh if somebody wants to do it, they can do it. Uh, and if it starts to make more and more sense over time, I think it will happen, uh, whether we want to or not, because it's possible. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, one more thing that I, I thought was kind of interesting. Um, um, uh, did you actually see my Space Chains uh, video? Uh, did you did you watch it or, or not? Um, actually, I, I did not. I kind of figured it would be yeah. mostly stuff we uh, talked about already. It, it was. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I would have done the same in, in your shoes. But uh, I was just thinking, like, towards the end of the video, um, I, I had this um, idea for uh, a use the tether space chain, where obviously use the tether is not, um, you know, it's not trustless. Uh, there's an issuer. But, you know, I, I feel like UC Tether is kind of like one of these things that's not supposed to exist, but somehow regulators are allowing it. And as long as they're allowing it, we might as well take advantage of it um, because these these USD, uh, you know, tokens can be used for buying Bitcoin as well, etc. So I think it's kind of a good gateway drug. Um, so you could actually create a chain that's entirely USD Tether and it doesn't even need to have space coins, right? You, you would just get... Um, get Tether to issue a bunch of USDT on there, sell the USDT, and then use the USDT for fees. Um, so that would be kind of a self-sustaining uh, chain right there, right? Mm -hmm. So given that we have a chain with USD Tether, what you can do is you can use the USD Tether as collateral for a contract that represents a Bitcoin. And and you, you put in like 1.5 times how much Bitcoin is worth. So you have like a sufficient amount of collateral. Um, and because the uh, space chain is actually aware of uh, the consensus of the main chain, you can have a contract that says, uh, yeah, there's there's 1.5 times use the tether uh, in, in the contract. And uh, let me see if I remember this right. Basically, if you want to get your collateral back, for the for the Bitcoin, so you create a virtual Bitcoin, right, with with 1.5 times uh, USD Tether collateral, and if you want your collateral back at the end of the day, you have to actually pay out real Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain to the address that the token holder wants, and if you don't do that, then the token holder gets your collateral, so they get more than the Bitcoin is actually worth in USD Tether, and what this does is it it, it creates a a virtual Bitcoin on top of this USD Tether chain. Okay. So, so this completely works. Uh, like there's no there's there's no shenanigans here. The only question is, do you put in enough collateral for for price changes to uh you know affect affect this chain? But now essentially you have USD Tether and you have a actual Bitcoin derivative that will be worth the Bitcoin because it's actually rede redeemable for Bitcoin uh, because of the way the, the space chain is aware of the uh, of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and, you know, not getting into too much technical details, but you can actually do this in a way that makes it fungible. And actually, I, I learned that thanks to uh, John Light. This is uh, apparently something that uh, TBTC does as well. And I wasn't quite aware of the, the way they, they made it fungible. Uh, but by fungible, I mean you can create a pool of people that does this. So you can have people that just put in use the Tether collateral and they create these uh, these, these these derivative Bitcoins. And, uh, and, and then they can just sell those Bitcoins to the markets. And these Bitcoins can actually be fungible where you don't need to care which Bitcoin, like which Bitcoin is connected to which uh, use the Tether collateral, but you can kind of create a pool out of it with uh, just consensus rules. Um, so that would be kind of awesome where... Um, yeah, now you you do sort of have a two like it's not a two way peg, right? Because they're not 
they're not real Bitcoins, they're, they're derivative Bitcoins. Uh, but you have Bitcoins and USD Tether on a chain completely decentralized like this. That is pretty awesome. Yeah. And so, honestly, yeah. also a random side tangent, but you just have me thinking it would be really interesting to get Tether to put Tether tokens on a space chain because if implemented right, um, yeah, um, couldn't anybody try to progress that that forward if they could construct the transaction the blocks get it committed to in the main chain yeah yeah the, the only thing you need is a commitment from uh from usd tether the issuers it, because it's an iou right they just you, you create anybody can create the chain as open source software and you just start off the chain with um uh you know a, a million usdt or something uh in um controlled by by actually use use the tether and you get them to sell it and hold uphold the peg and now the chain just uh, moves forward by itself yeah you don't you know it, it doesn't yeah it's just a completely decentralized way of moving use the tether only use the tether exists on the chain uh, you can use it to pay for fees etc that would be interesting yeah and so you know the simple thing to do like so i i was talking about okay so you can create actual bitcoin derivatives on on top of this chain inside of this chain uh, but obviously, you can also just use it for uh, swapping uh, between Bitcoin and UC Tether, uh, things like that. I think that as much as I love this idea, um, regulators would be very not loving of this idea. <laughs> yeah, that's why I love it because you know, like, like, like my my stance is that regulators are idiots for even allowing USDT. Like, I, I think that's. Like such a violation of all the all the regulations that have existed thus far, uh, but they've allowed it. So you know this kind of pushes it to the natural consequence where you're just saying like, okay, so we'll just get a chain that's completely using tether, but you know it's not being it's not being moved forward by USDT. Like you know like other people are doing that, but but it kind of is because USDT is what makes the whole thing work. Uh, so yeah, I think it's kind of uh, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, they are not smart people. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of how the world works, right? Like they allow certain things, they don't allow other things. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It, it just, yeah, I found it surprising. Uh, but, you know, so the way I see it is that, you know, if we keep pushing and we, we get to use the tether, you know, to places where really it's showing more and more how uncontrollable this is, I think eventually regulators will just stop it. But un until that moment arrives, I think, you know, let's let's go for it. Let's let's do this. <laughs> I think it's great. I am all there with you. Yeah, so that uh, exhausts uh, pretty much my my space chain stuff. Um, if you have a couple more minutes, I'll I'll run you through a few other like side projects I've been kind of uh, tapering with. Uh, these are all small things, so it won't take too long. Oh, what do you think, Shinobi? Go for it. Okay. Um. So. Do you know, uh, you, you know, I, I, you must be familiar with the original Ripple Pay idea before Ripple beca became a shitcoin. Do you know, like, what they were trying to do? Um, just vaguely payment processing. Um, I, I'm aware of that, but I have never really dug into mm -hmm. the meat of it. Okay, so it's actually kind of interesting. Um, so they were trying to uh, just kind of automate a, a, a thing called Hawala, which is... Um, uh, a, a, a payment method based on IOUs, where essentially it's exactly it's exactly like the Lightning Network, but it just it just works with uh, trust lines. So if you and I if we trust each other for a hundred bucks, then it means that you and I can move a hundred bucks between each other, and then that basically becomes just like a Lightning channel, where there's a hundred bucks between us. Uh, and then if I, you know, if I trust Mario from a uh, nice from podcast and you want to send some coins to Mario, you want to send some USD, USD or whatever, um, then you can do that through me because you trust me, I trust Mario, and that's how we move the whole thing forward. So this is an actual existing way of, of transferring value uh, across the world uh, called Hawala. Yeah, and, uh, uh, like Persian or Muslim um, style yeah. banking pretty much. Exactly. Uh, so the original Ripple Pay idea was just to to basically do that, but have it be more you know techy and uh, and have automated software that does that kind of keeps track of it. 
Um, so that idea is actually completely um, placeable inside of the Lightning Network. So what we can do is you and I, we can go to, uh, let's take the Liquid blockchain. We can go to Liquid. And we can both issue our own tokens. And these are just going to be IOU tokens. So one, uh, one Ruben coin is just one Bitcoin, but it's an IOU. So you gotta, you got to come back to me and actually redeem it. Um, but we can put those tokens into uh, uh, 2 of 2 multisig on the Liquid blockchain or on a spaceship or wherever. Um, and we can, we can just start using it as if it's actual Bitcoin and become part of the Lightning Network. And that actually just fully works. I, right now, have been nodding my head exactly like Jack Nicholson with that psychotic, <laughs> yes, I look on his face. Yeah. That is exactly one of the things I think is absolutely necessary for Lightning to have maximal scaling flexibility in the long term. And I am so happy to hear you actually kind of delving through and working on that. That would allow so much more flexible allocation of capital within people who would trust things like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, it just makes total sense, right? If you actually trust someone, why do you have collateral? Why do you have Bitcoin collateral? If you don't trust someone, yeah, then you need the Bitcoin collateral. And you can even do things like, uh, you know, do it like half-half where, you know, we both put a Bitcoin in our channel or something, but then on top of that, we'll allow for a little extra with the IOUs. So you can owe me a little bit more of the Bitcoin because of that. Uh, or, you know, like one Bitcoin is, 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 is obviously has just a one Bitcoin collateral inside of it. But then, you know, I also trust you so you can kind of extend it a little bit farther if you if you want. Um, so, yeah, stuff like that. And, you know, the, uh, the important thing to point out here is that uh, people have already kind of started doing this. Uh, there's something called hosted channels, uh, which is this idea of um, basically doing this, but without a blockchain under it. So, so you just kind of get a virtual channel from some counterparty that you trust, um, and you act with them as if you have a channel. But you know the issue with that is that one, you kind of have to hope that they keep proper track of things, right? They don't mess up your balance or anything. And two, you don't really have a way of proving whether or not what is happening between you and, and him uh, is is actually correct. So somebody could say like, oh, this guy stole money from me. And you have no, you, you have no way of, of, of proving, of saying like, oh no, I, I didn't steal. You, you, can, you cannot point to anything because there's nothing, uh, you know, nothing you can, uh, uh, yeah, there's nothing you can point to basically. Uh, but the interesting thing, even with that model already, I, I believe there were some other problems, but, but you know, the funny thing is it also just kind of makes that trust relationship. Um, so, so it's kind of a custodial relationship here, right? Where uh, they, uh, so, okay, so the way it works specifically is you go to a, a lightning company and you just open a virtual channel with them and they just start receiving Bitcoins, but it's virtual. So they start owing you, right? They haven't given you the Bitcoins yet, but they just take it on your behalf. Um, but the nice thing is that if you do have like a, a, a channel or, or act like there's a channel, you can actually spend those tokens over the lightning network in a way that's actually anonymous, because that's how lightning works, right? With the channel, like uh, you have hops and you don't really know where the money is going. So it's a custodial relationship where the custodian doesn't actually know where you're sending the money. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a cool uh, benefit. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, oh yeah. So, so there's one, like one other thing you could do here, which is uh, you could actually take it to court. So you could say like, okay, we're going to just draft a, an actual contract and say like, we're going to create this channel. And by the end of the day, you're going to pay me, uh, you know, back this many coins in Bitcoin, whatever it says on the Bitcoin blockchain. And, and you can try to enforce that uh, by law. <laughs> so you, you could try something like that where uh, you, you actually have evidence and you can actually take it to real court and try and get your Bitcoins that way. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's yet another way of, um, uh, of kind of merging, uh, you know, blockchains with law, um, uh, that could be interesting to to make it. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there there are use cases for that essentially. Yeah, I mean, even just socially, like with everything tracked on a chain like that, that you can close out. <clears throat> like you could discourage um, other people from engaging in those relationships with untrustworthy parties. Just signaling that. I mean, hell. 
um, depending on how motivated the response is, you could wind up having somebody's node actually ostracized on the Lightning Network. Like we're just going to close out channels and route, or route around you because you're here's proof you are not honoring like commitments like that to people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, there, there, will, there will be actual proof there, so yeah, that's nice. Um, yeah, that 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 helps a lot. Uh, yeah, I just think it's a, it's kind of one of those things that uh, just makes sense, right? It doesn't make sense for every situation, but it should exist. And uh, and this is kind of a very simple way of do it of, to do it. Like, it, it barely requires anything. You just need to be able to create a token, and then uh, you put it in a channel, and then there you go. Basically, that that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I guess two other um, small things that uh, I've been kind of thinking about. So, so one thing is um, this is kind of a thought that apparently has already been kind of half fulfilled. But uh, I had uh, Leo Wonderslab on uh, at the Honest Podcast, me and the other guys, and uh, this was whew, must have been a, a year ago or so by now. And he has this website called WalletScrutiny.com. Have you heard of it? Um, Wallets what me? Wallet Scrutiny. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know. Yeah, so what he does is he checks whether uh, Bitcoin wallets are uh, verifiable, uh, open source, etc. And, you know, turns out that not many are <laughs> any of that. So for the most yeah. part, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a real shit show. Um, so the problem is the wallet you're installing, even if it's open source, you don't know if the wallet you're installing is the same as the source code that, that you're looking at. So it could still contain some kind of backdoor. Uh, then there's auto updates. Uh, so that's an all, a whole another can of worms. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just really problematic and, and not very reliable. Even, even the wallets that do it all perfectly, they don't get enough review. Um, so even there, like, unless you go and you check the, the review, the code yourself, like it's very, you're just trusting someone. Basically you, you almost can't not trust someone. Like unless you made sure the code was actually reviewed properly, uh, you don't enable auto updates and you just go with that specific wallets version <laughs> and you do nothing after that. Theoretically, maybe. Okay. Uh, but in practice, it's almost impossible. So one of the things that I was thinking about is that what we need in this ecosystem is we need a generic signing wallet. So we need a, a piece of software that all it does is sign transactions. It's just like a hardware wallet, but it's, it's software. So it's just an app, an app that acts like a hardware wallet. I mean, it's not a hardware wallet at all, right? Like I'm not, I'm not saying here, uh, this is where your, your, your key is going to be secure because, uh, uh, because offline or something like none of that. Uh, you just run, you just have a generic app that does all the signing and then other people can build wallets around that app, just like uh, apps can use hardware wallets. They can use this app for signing. And the signing app, you know, we, we, we as a community have to make sure it's sufficiently reviewed. It doesn't get constant updates. Uh, you probably want to turn auto update off. Uh, definitely, actually. Um, and, and now you just have a lot more security guarantees, no matter what kind of you know shitty uh but nice looking app uh you want to use it doesn't matter because the place where you're signing is secure uh so yeah that's uh that's really something that i hope uh we can kind of move towards and i, I guess let's just kind of tweet it out and see how much uh interest there is but it seems to me like that is where things need to go uh and and there are already like there are already apps that kind of do something like this where um you know, usually the two things that are, that are different about it, like one, usually um, they expect you to install the second app on another phone uh, and then you keep that phone offline. And I think that's great too. So now you kind of have an offline signing device uh, and you know, did this app should, should be able to do the same thing, but it's, it's always not generic. It's always like, oh, you, you know, uh, if you have blue wallets, you need to install the blue wallet, wallet companion app or whatever it's called uh, to do that. Um, so yeah, I want it to be generic so everybody can kind of use it and, uh, yeah. And, and you could either use it on the same phone or you can use it on a different phone, something like that. Yeah, I would absolutely love to see something like that. I mean, I think in general wallets need to get broken up into the different components like that and apps just start becoming more wrappers around stuff than 
actually implementing from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh yeah, that's really something I, I hope uh will yeah, we'll we'll get to eventually. So I don't know. I'll put out a tweet, kind of see what other people are working on because I I kind of can't imagine like there aren't already people working on this. And I saw one app that actually does do this, which unfortunately I forgot the name of. Um but uh, yeah, it comes pretty close to this already, but it's 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 specific to their app, so it's, it's not kind of a thing that an, anybody can build uh, a wallet on top of. And so that's about the only thing there. Mm-hmm. Uh, slowly but surely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort. I mean, people got to build these things. So yeah. So the uh, the last thing uh, I want to mention is um, I've. Uh, uh, there's a guy called Robin. I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know much about him. I've just been chatting with him <laughs> on Telegram, and um, him and I have been kind of like brainstorming on a way to uh, divide up a 24-word seed in a way that's a little bit more secure. So, uh, so are, are you familiar with like this method where you just take 16 words of your 24 words? And you create kind of like three, uh, three wallets out of, or, or yeah, three 16 word seeds out of it. Basically, and you just you, you split it up, and now you kind of have a two of three multi sig. Well, not multi sig, but you, you know what I mean. Yeah, where you only need two of the three to actually recover it all. Yeah, right. So the thing about this method is that it's 16 words, so you're 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 eight words short of uh, of linking your key. And while eight words uh, is, is quite difficult to find, um, there's like another slight problem, which is that the uh, the last word is actually a checksum. So that one doesn't count. So on one of the uh, shards, you only have seven words worth of security. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I actually have been uh, kind of looking uh, with Robin at a kind of a way to uh, use uh, just an XOR operation to basically be able to split the word the words into three times 12 words. Uh, instead of so instead of three times sixteen words, you get three times twelve words, and what this means is that uh, you have to do a little bit of math, uh, but you know that doesn't have to be difficult. It's just kind of plus or minus, uh, or uh, we even have kind of a method uh, that we're kind of testing right now where you can just do it with a piece of paper by kind of moving two pieces of paper around. You can figure out how to how to basically do an XOR operation on two words. Um, so what this would look like is you have one piece of paper with all the words, you have another piece of paper with some squares on it or, or rect- rectangles, and you just move it around. Uh, and uh, you, wherever the rectangle lands, essentially, well, it's not exactly like that. Uh, that's going to be the, uh, the word A, X, or a word B, basically. So you wouldn't even have to do math. You would just have to print out two pieces of paper and, uh, and kind of slide them around. Um, yeah, then you would have uh, actual... Uh, 12 word security instead of uh, you know eight words uh, being a potential issue. So yeah, it's kind of a cool thing I think where it's sort of practical. Uh, you can actually split up your word your words off chain, uh, sorry off uh, <laughs> offline, uh, and uh, yeah, not really worry too much about it getting uh, uh, hacked or something or, or uh, brute forced because uh, 12 words are missing. That would actually be really nice too, because like I I have never felt with those um split cards just because of like eight eight words that's a little uncomfortable for me like yeah. Im- improving yeah. that a little bit like that would be awesome yeah 12 words seems about the uh, sweet spot because you know we, we're using 12 word seats as well uh 24 words or, or 12 uh you know or 18 even is, is another one um so yeah this uh this kind of makes it more secure basically yep that is nice that is the 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 kind of little the little stuff thinking about how normal users interact with things and how to make it impossible to fuck up like yeah. not enough people really concentrate on that yeah and it's also like because you know we have shamir but like it's it, you need like a hardware wallet that supports it and then you split up the shares and then you know you're you're kind of dependent on kind of a niche implementation that you have to hope that is going to be supported in future as well. And this is just something you can do with pen and paper uh, on your own. Uh, so so it seems just kind of more, you know, yeah, practical, where you, you have a 24-word seed, you don't need any devices whatsoever, you just print out a piece of paper and you go. 
I'm I'm definitely bullish on Tremere long term, but that's gonna be a nightmare. Like especially with Trezor kind of running ahead and doing their slip standard without considering like how compatible that'll be with other devices because of resource constraints and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I I worry about that stuff as well. Like we really need standards. I mean, you know, we're we're, we're moving to multisig anyway, and then I, I think Shamir is kind of not even necessary anymore because you know you, you have. You know, it's kind of like instead of splitting your key and having to put it back together, you just have multisig. You can sign for multiple devices. I think that's sort of where we're going to end up anyway. But, you know, it's going to take a long time. And, and this is just something practical we can do in the meantime. Definitely. Yeah, so I've uh, pretty much vomited all, all everything I've been working on uh, out uh, right now. So... Uh, I don't know if there's anything else you want to discuss or maybe something uh, you know, you've been thinking about that we can uh, go through. Um, but other- otherwise, uh, on my end, uh, I've said about everything, I think. Well, I'm kind of plumbed out on your end, but um, I don't know, re- real quick, I guess, um, in light of the silly convo on Twitter about Mars coins and stuff. Um, so... Um, I've had this idea for a while and I'm still kind of 50 50 whether this has any chance of really working or whether it would just implode on itself. But, um, I've been thinking about a side chain design for something like Mars, um, enabled by an op code on the main chain that would quite literally require proof of work. Um, like a uh, difficulty target met on the transaction mm-hmm. as a witness instead of a signature or something. And effectively Mars could have their own proof of work algorithm, um, have their side chain um, that does that. But those miners also unlock the coins on earth. And mm-hmm. the idea would be that you could quickly um, shift the difficulty of the side chain down by providing proofs um, that you are mining a transaction to move something on the the main chain on earth. And then effectively like that would get unlocked eventually when you hit the difficulty target, do stuff on earth, and then miners could go back to mining the side chain. And that way you could have some kind of mechanism where as long as earth doesn't secretly start beating mars in the asic race on that algorithm um you have coins actually locked up for mars with their own side chain and it's not an explicitly trusted thing like it's not these eight people on mars own everybody's bitcoin on the main chain mm. so i guess the first thing i i am thinking of here is that having a, a certain amount of proof of work on top of a transaction is sort of what's happening in Bitcoin naturally already, right? When we have, um, mm-hmm. when a Bitcoin transaction gets mined and then more and more blocks get mined on top of it, uh, that those next blocks are are building proof of work on top of that transaction. Uh, so you could take the SPV proof and a bunch of blocks that were found after the SPV proof and utilize that as a... Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of a proving mechanism. Whether or not this is going to be more secure than SPV, uh, I'm not sure. Um, well, see, that's the thing is like, um, I'm I'm talking like quite literally, it would be like opcode this hashing algorithm. There, There's no public key, nothing locking it. It's literally yeah. just give me the hash algorithm, a difficulty target, and that explicitly on the transaction is that transaction's witness. So kind of like moving the proof of work down from the the block header level to like this is actually the transaction witness. Yeah, and is it like, um, are we expecting this to be like Merce mind? So 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 you're no, saying it would be a totally separate okay. proof of work. Like Mars has its own algorithm. It's not SHA two fifty six. And no, they yeah, use no, I... that to mine the the side chain and to kind of uh, lock coins with this new opcode on the main chain. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So what I mean is like, um, so on the on the Mars chain side, right? They, they have to provide a certain amount of hashes in order to unlock some coins on the on the main chain, right? On Earth. Mm-hmm. 
And when they when they create those hashes, are they simultaneously creating blocks for the Mars sidechain, or or is that a separate like? No, do they have? That's like you literally are just mining the transaction. And, okay. and the idea would be you could have a kind of dynamic difficulty adjustment where as long as like proofs are included in the block that somebody's mining an earth transaction, it will let the side chain's difficulty go down so that the block times don't increase for that. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's God, that's very difficult to reason about. Um, yeah, do you have like uh, some some Twitter thread about it or or any kind of write up? Like, I feel like this is something you know to sit down well, and think about. But it's qu- interesting. Quite literally, just an idea I've had bouncing around my head for a while. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's how it starts. Uh, it's it's interesting to uh, kind of think about. Like, yeah, I, I'm kind of thinking, why not have the Mars chain while they're creating their own chain? also kind of provide proofs that only yeah i mean maybe it becomes more of a kind of a minor sort of control kind of thing but uh yeah i'm not sure yeah i yeah, it's, it's difficult to reason about but interesting well maybe i'll get off my butt and do a write-up or something soon yeah and i think it's also good to uh you know like what usually happens is you do a write-up and then halfway through your write-up you figure out what's wrong with it <laughs> you know because you're you're actually writing it down uh but uh yeah yeah every now and then it actually ends up being something that works so that could be cool too well let's roll the dice but i'm no reuben sampson <laughs> you know you, you don't know how many failed proposals i've had man like i go and i start to write something down and then halfway through the process i figure out it's not working so you know you you only get to see the uh the stuff that that makes it through but all, all the stuff that failed there, there's a lot there man I can imagine based on how much didn't. Yep. But yeah, I guess uh, that was my final uh, thing floating around my brain. It's starting to All shut right. down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been talking for a long time. I think it's a good uh, good point to end it. Mm-hmm. So I guess um, you know, any last comments uh, you want to make for the listeners before we sign off? Um. Yeah. Uh, go check out the Unice podcast. Nice. Uh, we do. A l- a lot of nice banter and a bit of technical stuff here and there. Uh, good, good mix uh, for the uh, people who are sick of the, uh, I guess the the Twitter um, mobs deciding everything. I think we're a little bit more uh, middle groundy, so that's kind of nice. Uh, and uh, yeah, I already mentioned the. Uh, uh, if you like this kind of technical talk, I would also check out the uh, Van Weerdem Shorts NATO podcast. They do a great job. Um, basically going through technical Bitcoin things and explain them clearly. Uh, so that's really cool. Uh, so check them out as well. I'm, I'm a, a guest there every every now and then. So uh, you can hear, you can listen to me there as well. Um, so yeah, check out those things and check me out on Twitter. All right. So I guess uh hope everybody does that. Hope everyone enjoyed the conversation and catch yeah. you later, punks. See ya. Was there, was there,